Richard Parks. When my rugby career was ended through injury, I became an extreme environment athlete. In just 197 days, I skied to the North and the South Poles and climbed to the top of the highest peak on every continent, setting a new world record. And that included Mount Everest, the most iconic mountain on the planet. I love what I do now. To earn a living in high performance sport is a privilege. And the first chapter of my life, I was a professional rugby player. Wales, win cups with Leeds, Ponapreve, and play in four countries as well. But the bottom dropped out of my world when I was forced to retire through injury. And overnight, it was as if I fell off the edge of a cliff. It was a really difficult transition. And I didn't handle it well. I, I was angry, scared, frustrated. I wasn't ready to retire. And I know we all have our challenges, but in that moment, my perception was that, like I said, the bottom just dropped out of my world. But it was a sentence from my late grandmother's funeral. The horizon is only the limit of our sight. Combined with a book I was reading at the time, uh, an autobiography of Saran Fiennes that really was the catalyst to giving me the courage and the inspiration to, to pick myself up to start moving again and to channel my energies into, into something positive and, and climb out of quite a deep depression. My advice to you as a medical professional is that you should stop playing. These were the words that changed my life. People that I met along my journey, mentors, sponsors, helped evolve my 737 challenge into the world first that it finished and becoming the first and arguably still the only person to have climbed the highest mountain on each of the world's seven continents and stood on all three poles, the North Pole, the South Pole and the summit of Everest in the same calendar year, completing it in seven months has irreversibly changed my life and opened doors um, that I would have never dreamt of. And, to still be able to earn a living in high performance sport through my expeditions, through my honorary lecture roles and being a board member of Sport Wales is a real privilege. And, uh, and yeah, it's a quite a unique transition to here, but you know, it's a, it's a cool one. <laughs> How I prepare for expeditions is unique to each expedition. I pride myself on my preparation. I pride myself on how hard I work and many times when things have gone against me. In fact, it's actually been that meticulous attention to detail that has been not just the saving grace in the project, but actually save potentially catastrophic situations. The preparation for the expeditions has, is often pretty brutal, uh, but it has to be, you know, when you're attempting something that nobody else has attempted, physiologically, you have to be absolutely on it, but also psychologically, it's a real challenge. So pushing myself to those limits and amassing a toolbox of skills to manage the unforeseen changes in circumstance and event is, uh, is a key part of the preparation. The reality is we all have challenges in our day-to-day -day lives and, and, and all our challenges are different, but they're relative to each and every one of us. We all have our mountains to climb and of all the high performance athletes that I've worked with and in my own expeditions, in my own experience, my own career, for me, perseverance is, is a really simple behavior, but it's a behavior that's a limiting one, I think. And if you take for granted that all high performance athletes have the right genetics, the right skills, the right coaches, you take all that for granted, at some point, we are all gonna be faced with a challenge, whether it be injury, whether whatever it may be, um, in life or in sport. And I think the concept of not giving up the concept of perseverance is, for me, is at the core of, uh, of, what, of what I do. And, you know, the um, Thomas Edison, who invented the light bulb, I think he posed the question, how many of life's failures um, never realised how close they were to success? Antarctica was uh, solo, unsupported and unassisted from the coast of Antarctica to the South Pole and uh, 
you know, Antarctica is one of the world's most hostile environments. The unpredictability, the volatility, and the extremes out there. But doing that solo, um, on my own, requires a, a unique and specialist set of skills, and time and a team to develop those skills here in Wales. Um, and the unsupported means that I was carrying everything I needed for that expedition. So the, the, there was there was no food resupplies, and you know, should I break any equipment, there's no assistance with that. Um, and the unassisted means that it's entirely through human power that that I'm moving from the coast to to the South Pole. So no kites, no mo 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 motorized vehicles or, or anything. The challenges of performing in Antarctica are one thing, you know, temp the coldest temperature I had on this expedition was minus 45 wind chill. It's entirely uphill, <laughs> so from sea level or from the ice, uh, the depth of the ice at sea level to just under 3,000 metres at the South Pole. The, the challenge of skiing into the catabatic winds that come off the polar plateau means basically you're skiing into a headwind the entire expedition. And being unsupported means I'm dragging uh, a sled my particular said was around 65 kilos. That's one thing. That's that that in itself is 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 pretty limiting. But that that kind of uh, performing solo really turns a microscope on on your kind of internal dialogue as well. And I think um, staying motivated and disciplined throughout the expedition is hard. I completed the expedition. Uh, in 28 days, which is the second fastest time in history. And kind of to put it into context, the next fastest time after that is 38 days. Um, so we were operating right at, at the top of the game. But in order to do that, it's about maximizing the time skiing and sleeping and minimizing all the other time. So I developed a strategy here in Wales to ski for 16 hours a day in one hour and 10 minute blocks with a five minute break at the end of each block. And I was gonna sleep for 30 minutes halfway through the day and two hours at the end of the day. Having kind of the, the discipline to, to maintain that, that, that strategy when all you wanna do is stop, all you wanna do is, is put picture tent and get in. And when you're in your sleeping bag, you, all you wanna do is stay in it. Um, that's hard and without anyone to kind of bounce off or to kind of G you up when you're down. But probably one of the, the hardest challenges performing solo is managing that internal dialogue. You know, we, we, all, we all have an internal dialogue in our normal lives, that kind of voice, the bad voice, that kind of tells you to uh, just, just press snooze on the alarm, you know, or, or do you know what, if just, just give up, just don't do that, stop doing that, or you're not good enough to do that, or you can't do that, or, we all have that voice um, and it's kind of one thing managing it here and it can be really tough to manage it here in the normal world but when you're out there and you're on your own and it's minus 45 and the wind's literally burning your skin because it's so cold, um, I've still got some frost damage on my face, like that's that voice becomes really loud <laughs> and the other voice, can get quite quiet at times, uh, and that that is probably the hardest mental and emotional side to, to this particular type of expedition. There was one particular phase of, of this of this expedition when I got hit with with a particularly cruel and and harsh kind of weather front that came in, and at this point I had been ahead of the world record. At this point I was on the world record pace and I had skied about seven, roughly 700 kilometers. I was about uh, 20 days in. Physically, mentally, absolutely frazzled, but I was on it, um, and I got hit with, uh, with pretty crap weather. Um, the snow conditions deteriorated around that particular period of the route, and I knew that was expected, uh, uh, and I was in quite a heavy sastrugi zone, which is basically the shapes that are carved into the ice and, and snow that's deposited into the ice that creates these big kind of ice sculptures, they're called sastrugi. And this particular zone or area, they were anything from a meter high to, you know, as high as a, a transit van. So it was over them, around them, you know, um, and it made life physically hard on the skis. Um, 
I had zero visibility, uh, so we had, well, I had flat light for, for, for three days, which meant I couldn't see anything, so no contrast, no horizon, uh, no shadow, so I, I didn't know where I was putting my foot or my ski, and this cold snap, so minus 45 wind chill, and that basically ground me to a halt. Um, you know, I can move in flat light, I can move in cold, I can move in sastrugi, but that kind of perfect kind of equation of all three happening at the same time meant my daily distances dropped from just under 50k down to about 15k. And it was then that I realised that the, the, the world record that I know I'm capable of beating and I was beating um, slipped away from me. And that really kind of... Uh, challenge my my kind of resilience and my 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 determination because i uh every part of me wanted to just quit at that point every part of me wanted to give up and go home i couldn't really figure out why i was there um but the project was always about something bigger than me um it always was that's not a cliche that's what gets me up in the morning that's what got me to training at nyack that's what powers the last two years, two and a half years, and really wanting a win for everyone involved and wanting to finish the project successfully is what kind of got me through that. And that was a real grind, really, really tough four or five days. Uh, to add to that, uh, I had to ration my food, um, which meant I went from 7,000 calories down to 2,000 calories a day, um, but still skiing 16, 19 hours a day. That last... Um, that last six days of the X bed was probably the hardest six days of my life, um, and I really mean that. But it's funny how quickly we forget the bad times because the second I arrived at the pole, I uh, well after a little, a little after a little cry, a little tear into my Welsh flag. Uh, actually, I was um, I genuinely felt joy and genuinely felt elation, and it's kind of it's funny how quickly we forget the bad times. Each project that that I do, whether it's the big ones that happen every two or three years or the kind of smaller projects in between, um, they each have a different why. You know, we, we, we find ourselves in different points of our lives with different challenges or different, you know, uh, things going on. There are some kind of solid, immovable whys that kind of that stay with me and, and, I, and I think the, the, um, the first thing is there's some really interesting work being done at the moment researching the mental health benefits that adventure can, can give us above and beyond mainstream exercise or, or physical activity. Obviously I, I didn't know this 10 years ago but um, when injury into my rugby career I you know I, 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 I fell off the edge of a cliff and, and it, it was the darkest period for me uh, with the darkest thoughts. And I, th I think y y learning how to climb was my way out of that dark hole. I didn't really realize the, the kind of, um, I didn't realize the impact that adventure would have on me at that time, but I certainly wanted something that would push me physically, push me mentally, um, and that was scary. <laughs> Um, it was my way of kind of getting control back in my life. And, and fast forward uh, uh, a decade, um, I'm still doing the things that I do and I'm, I, I, actually, I actually, you know, I'm still kind of pushing myself physically, mentally and emotionally because actually I, I personally get a lot of growth from that. I personally, I, I really enjoy those kind of self-development opportunities that come in times of adversity and in conditions, uh, in, in hostile conditions, uh, that kind of resilience, that mental strength, just just the coping skills around managing the unpredictability, these are all transferable, and I transfer these into my day-to-day -day life. So I personally enjoy pushing myself, particularly in extreme and hostile environments, because um, it, it, it kind of grounds me here, here in the real world. I've proven it. You know, one of the most difficult decisions I've had to make was to abort my first solo Antarctic expedition just 100 kilometers from the South Pole after battling the elements for 42 days. I believe that I have the right balance of 
humility and defiance and uh, respect for the environment that I'm in. We're each put on this planet with a, a unique skill set. And, uh, and I think part of our journey is finding that unique skill and that unique value that we can add to the world. <laughs> Bizarrely, mine is this. Um, and actually, you know, what, when, once we do have the opportunity to, to, to go fast, once we do have the opportunity to, to, to work at the top of our game, I think, you know, we have a real responsibility to add value, to, to give back and, and, and to make the world a better place. And, you know, in, in, in a small way, relatively small way you know that this is you know that this is how I can leave the world a better place and you know the, the the projects I do are partly about the the the, the physical endeavor but actually they're becoming more and more about this kind of societal footprint that they leave in 2011, I became the first person to climb the highest mountain on each of the world's seven continents and ski to the North and the South Pole in the same calendar year. Completing the project in, in six months and 11 days, the first person to, to complete this in, in, in a calendar year. Richard Parks here, calling you from the summit of Mount Vincent. We've had great weather on the summit day today. Uh, my, myself and the team submitted uh, 1.50 Chilean time on the 8th of January 2011. I'm making this call from the summit of Mount Vincent, the uh, highest mountain in, in Antarctica, and uh, the second leg of my 77 challenge. Uh, I'm, I'm calling you from the summit of Aconcagua, 6,962 metres. The uh, third leg of my 77 challenge and the second of the seven summits, and uh, it's just an awesome, awesome feeling. We uh, in total there uh, one, two, three, four, five. There's five of us that summited from the team, and uh, it's just a fantastic feeling. It's absolutely brutal day. Uh, Twelve hour climb from three this morning to just before three this afternoon we summited. And, that's only half a job, we've got to get back down now, so uh, we're just uh, getting some food into us and some food into us to draw energy back up to climb down now. How much food you carry and how much calories you burn. Obviously the more food you carry, the heavier your sled, the more calories you burn. You add into that the challenge of trying to move quickly faster than anyone else has ever done in history and you're burning more calories and it's more the weight of your equipment is even more critical. This was my fourth solo expedition on the continent, my sixth expedition in total in Antarctica and um, I had both a wealth of history and experience but equally that comes with kind of baggage and, 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 and a rigidity in, in how I was thinking. I developed a strategy with my performance director to to move for longer. So I was skiing for 16 to 19 hours a day, and this was because this was to de-risk the weather conditions. I couldn't guarantee on having great conditions to move quickly, but I knew I could move for longer. It's quite easy to kind of be stuck with what's always been done. You know, three meals a day, four meals a day, dehydrated meals. Um, uh, and, and actually, it's pretty amazing, regardless of developments in technology and equipment and, and skis and clothing, like food rations is still really archaically and conservatively thought of in, in this community. So anyway, so the students looked at how could they create a food system that would give me as much calories as possible in as little weight as possible. I knew that I was going to be burning between 10 and 11,000 calories every day. We can't carry that. My first solo expedition, I carried 5,000 calories. Second solo expedition, it was 5,800 calories. Uh, last year, we got that to just over 6,000 calories. This year, we took a, a giant leap because we created a, a, a 7,200 calories a day and it meant that they designed kind of nutritionally balanced 
specific to kind of what I wanted and what knew, what I knew worked for me. Um, both solid and liquid food uh, supplements that I was able to take throughout the day, um, which meant I was able to kind of drip feed around uh, five, six hundred calories every hour in, 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 into me, which meant I could sustain that level of performance for, for 28 days. Um, and that, that was a real game changer, actually, because, you know, we can all do one big day. We can all do maybe two or three big days. The real challenge was staying fit and staying healthy and replicating 16 to 19 hours a day for 28 days. And uh, and they absolutely crushed it, fair play to them. The last week, 10 days of the expedition were, were, were tough. And it's really kind of hard to articulate, but the cumulative fatigue, the cumulative sleep deprivation and the added kind of challenge uh, that was posed when I had to ration my food ration, when I had to ration my food supplies um, meant I was I was you know I was hanging on by my fingernails um, you, I had strategically planned to take 25 days of food I knew that the margins were tight um, I was confident to be able to to complete the expedition in 25 days, given good weather conditions. But equally, the rations were designed in such a way, they were such big calorie days that I knew I could stretch the 25 to 27 days of food. The real challenge came though when that weather system came in and challenged me to have to stretch the, the food from 25 to, to 29 days. And, uh, that meant going from 7,200 calories a day to just over 2,000 calories a day, but actually having to increase my hours skiing from 16 to 19 hours in order to cover the distance. And it, it was horrific, like horrific. Physically, I, 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 I was wrecked, and, and I don't know how else to say it. I'm, I lost 14 kilos of body weight throughout the expedition. I knew that I wasn't getting the nutrients in I, I needed, to, to, to sustain that level. In some bizarre way, I can feel every day my kind of body eating itself. Um, the hardest thing though w w was the mental challenge that came with that. Because I had the food in my sled, but I knew I could only eat 2,000 calories a day. And when every single part of you is screaming, crying for anything, like an extra bar, extra half a bar, an extra cup of coffee, whatever it is, sugar. Um, the hardest thing w w was staying disciplined in that. I'm sure I'll have reflections for many months, many years. Um, you know, f for me, it, it just came back to a really, really, a really simple, a simple kind of emotion. And that's, you know, I needed to get the job done. And, uh, I needed to finish with a win. I I could have taken a resupply, a food resupply, and I wrestled with that every minute of every hour of every day of that last week. You know, I, I, I was carrying um, my Welsh flag, I was carrying my, my British flag, and I had my sponsors on the side of my sled, Cardiff Met, JLL, Sony, Hiscox. And those things, they, they, they might just, seem trivial or they just you know we kind of talk about them in passing but they 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 mean something to me every one of those companies on the side of my sled had invested time effort belief into me you know my family my performance coach um and those flags meant something to me and, and finishing the project in the way that i started finishing with integrity getting the job done, it, it was really that simple. And uh, I, I, I still maybe don't quite know how I did it, but I managed to dig in and get to the pole. And I tell you what, that, 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 first, uh, that first can of Coke felt freaking amazing. The real icing on the cake the re <laughs> is seeing how miserable, how miserable a time the crew are having filming this up here. <laughs> 
I know that's not very nice, but they've been teasing me for the last four days, so now it's my turn. At my weakest, most fragile, most vulnerable, it, it's my team that drives me to keep going. And as bizarre as this sounds, even my solo expedition, so even my solo speed record in Antarctica, it was my team that was my biggest driver. I mean, I don't see it as a solo project. It was an 18 month team project that I simply did the last 29 days on my own. And for me being part of something bigger and the concept of letting people down is far more painful than any pain I could feel in the moment. Corporate partnerships to the technical partnerships and the equipment partnerships, I've really felt a sense that everyone has been really engaged and I felt so much support to, to get the job done that that certainly is one of the things that powers me when I'm out there um, on my own. It's really easy to do what's always been done. It's really easy to make the same choices that the person before you made. Uh, and we see that in so many like things. Obviously, we're talking about polar expeditions, um, but that that applies to so many things. And after the the disappointment of last year's expedition, you, you know, uh, it, it it became really clear to me and, and and to those involved in the project that you, you know we couldn't do the same thing again. You know, isn't that kind of the definition of madness or something, doing the same thing and expecting different results or something, I don't know. You know, when I've personally found the courage to let go, really wonderful things happened. And, you, you know, the, the by looking at the problems differently and by having different perspectives, different a different lens, and not having kind of the baggage th that I had from five other expedition, expeditions in Antarctica meant that we came up with different solutions and better solutions for, you know, some tough problems. And, and, and the equipment that was developed and, uh, you know, the food that was developed, all, all of these things um, were critical in, in, in the success of the project. Um, all, all, all of that stuff is, it's re was really inspirational to me and really powerful to me. But the thing that I learned in a nutshell was just how important it is to have the courage to bring the diversity of team together in a project and how important it is to have the courage to look at problems with fresh sets of eyes. And it's difficult on your own because we all have our baggage and our experience and, and, and all of that stuff that's really powerful in some things, but, but you know, just rip up all the pages and, 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 and rewrite some of the things that, that have been done for centuries. Yeah, and that was a huge inspiration to me.